our show tonight, we're talking about Harry Potter. Harry Potter? You ever heard of him? Yeah, but why? I really didn't get into Harry Potter because I'm sure it was full of satanic, occultish type stuff, but I just didn't ever really get off into it. Was you a Harry Potter kid growing up? Yeah, I read all the books. You're J. lying. All, all the, no. You're lying. I read every J.K. Man, look, Rollins, there's not a black man alive, God. Yeah, I, I, I was, I'm a unicorn. Yeah, I still got the books. <laughs> got the books, got all the movies. That was my era. You ever see The Exorcist? Oh, yeah, f me up as a kid. Now they got Dumbledore gay in Harry Potter. In the J.K. Rollins book, Dumbledore wasn't gay. The head wizard dude is gay. He got a husband. But he didn't have no husband in the book. It's just the world got to be politically correct. I won't pay anybody to scare me. That's some white people shit. I'm black in America, in Tennessee. I'm scared all the time, so I don't do Ferris wheels, roller coasters. <laughs> Scary movies, none of that. Bigfoot? I believe Bigfoot existed. You don't believe in Bigfoot? Yeah, I was married to one. <laughs> Got something to say, you wanted to play. Then come running my way and ruin G-Status is dead. No, ready to go, about to go in, you already know. Got my instructions, now give me your audience, hand me your mic and I'm ready to blow. Rah. One for the money, two for the show. Three for everybody who encouraged me to go, 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 get it. We finally did it, I ain't never turning back. I'm fully committed, committed to my beliefs I'm committed to the city I'm about to give them what they want, what they need, what they ask for Give them what they want, what they need, what they ask for And now, from his very own basement in a fortified castle High atop the Smoky Mountain Wilderness It's the Master of Mysteries The Nostril Domus of the Impending Apocalypse The Voice of the Silenced America's Favorite Uncle And the host of Jim Spiracy Jimmy Dodds. What they want, what they need, what they ask for. Yes. What's happening, y'all? Welcome to Jim Spiracy. I'm your host, your humble servant, James D. Dodds. Before I even get started, hey man, I got a joke for y'all. All right, I'm going to do a little Jamil on y'all. Y'all ready? All right. <clears throat> knock, knock. Y'all supposed to all say, who's there? And then I'm going to say, me. Y'all say, me who? And then I say, me, you, and God. That's who. <laughs> What's good, fam? How are y'all, man? Hey, man, I'm so blessed to be here. I'm blessed to see y'all here. And I ask that God just lets his blessing show on this shine on this show. I ask God blessings show and shine on my special guest today. Oh, my goodness. I got a special guest for y'all. Hey, man. Listen here. Like the theme song said, man. I'm going to give you what you want, what you need, what you ask for. No, I'm not. I'm not going to give you what you want. Because I know what you want. You messy. You want in my business, but I'm going to let y'all in my business. I'm going to tell y'all something. Tell y'all something about my business. You know, my grandmother told me that a closed mouth don't get fed. All right, so here you go. Hey, man. Before I am just, I'm going to tell you something. I'm in my feelings. I'm feeling some kind of way. Okay, people are like, ah, oh, you shouldn't feel it. You know what? It's all right. People always tell you how you should react in a situation, how you should be in a situation. But sometimes, sometimes, sometimes I start to feel some kind of way. Okay? So that's why young people say, I'm in my feelings. Kind of got in my feelings this week about the show and just about everything. About the best way I can describe it, it's like, it's like being invited on a trip by somebody and then all of a sudden out of nowhere you just get put out and ain't nothing you can do about it then when somebody say hey what the hell happened to Jimmy oh he just he just jumped out the car 
You're a liar. Here's some facts, y'all. I'm unemployed. Hmm? Say what? That's right. I'm unemployed. I know y'all finding it hard to believe. You're like, boy, that's a nice little studio you got there. The show looks good. And you know what? You're absolutely right. Because I want y'all to tell me a podcast that looks as good as this show. I mean, this show was designed. This show was actually offered to a couple of studios. For some reason, they declined. Matter of fact, I was told straight up I wasn't intelligent enough. I wasn't intelligent enough to host to do my own show. Now, on some for real, for real, you know, some people are like, hey, kiss my butt cheeks. I'm intelligent enough. Sometimes, man, if you hear that mess all your life, you mess around and let that start taking effect on you. You start believing. Nonetheless, man, let me tell y'all this, man. I'm at a point, man, that I can't listen to that, man. And the reason I can't listen to that, because you know why? Because God didn't say it. <laughs> God didn't say it, Okay. But let me just let me just put it out here, man. Let me let, let, let me just expose myself to y'all. Because the fact of the matter is a brother may need to go start him a GoFundMe account. Facts. Seriously. Hey man, I'm unemployed. I got two kids. I got a mortgage. <laughs> hey, I need you to like me. I need you to pray for me. I need you to click the subscribes. Whether you like me or not. And if you don't like me, hey man, seriously, how do y'all say it? How you say it? It's a harmless white lie. Or for some of y'all, it's just a harmless mulatto lie. Okay? Or for some of us, it's a strong, heavily mandingo pigmented lie. fact of the matter is we don't get paid until we hit 1,000 subscribers okay we closing in on 600 but we need to step it up you know like you ladies say sometimes be quick but don't hurry seriously man we need to step it up I need your help I don't know what it takes but some of y'all got them troll accounts out there and I need you to click in on your on your burner accounts. Seriously, tell your friends about this show, man. You know, because this is what we're gonna need to do to get it off. I gotta start. I gotta start telling y'all this. And hey, let's be real. Let, let, let's let's keep it a thousand. It ain't like I don't know how to start a show. It ain't like I don't know how to come out and start a show. I don't know how to open a show. I don't know how to ask you to click the likes, click the subscribes. God damn it, I come out here every day and do a show for somebody else, but sit up and tell me I can't do a show on my own. You're tired of this, man. I'm in my feelings. Tired of having to be the bigger man. I ain't nothing but 175 pounds, soaking wet, with rocks in my pocket. People running around here two times my weight. God damn it, go pick on somebody your own size. Hell, I was gonna do today's show without no guests. My producer called me and said, hey, we've got an exorcist today. Really? A freaking exorcist? Whew. Hey man. Give them what they want, what they need, what they ask for. That's why God tell you, be careful what you pray for. You just might get it. Hey, man, let me tell y'all something, man. 
I think tonight's theme is bad things sometimes happen to good people. But being the bigger man is tiring. It's trying. It gets under my nerves. I'm 60 years old. And let me let me tell y'all something, man. Some of y'all know this, man. When you, I don't even like using the word Christian. When you just try to just live right, man. You just try to just basically, just basically do right. You know, as a matter of fact, they say that you know you're doing right when, 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 when trouble and hard times come. I know that. But sometimes I want other people to experience that. I know God has a wrath. Sometimes, I'm not going to lie, sometimes I want to see God's wrath hit other people. But, I guess that's what the Bible story tonight is going to be about. You know. But you know, the fact of the matter is, man, God makes us whole in the end, man. Okay? And I think that that's really the, the gist of what I'm saying. I'm telling you I'm a little salty. I'm telling you I feel some kind of way. But you know, man, if you know God and you know you know how this thing works. Anything good ain't gonna come easy. And right about now, this ain't coming easy. But I'm ready for the fight, man. God is good all the time. And all the time, God is good. Let's make this show roll. Got a few headlines for you. Got a few headlines for you. I like to call these headlines. <laughs> I told you so. <laughs> for real. By the way, man, tell me something. Has, has anybody, is it just me, but seriously, is anybody sitting up looking at the news? Anybody sitting up just watching, seeing what happens? Anybody seeing what just happened? In Death Valley. Anybody see what happened? Flash floods close road in the Death Valley National Park in northern Arizona. Nevada's also hit hard. They got more rain in one day than they've gotten all year. And for some of y'all that aren't geographicalologists. This is in the desert, y'all. Okay, I can't really see this too well, but those people walking across that water. Y'all know, y'all know what kind of, y'all know. That's very dumb, y'all. Don't walk across water like that, okay? But uh, as you see, that's going on in Death Valley. Come on, man. Doesn't the Bible speak of that? Doesn't the Bible speak of the days and the weather is going to be changing and we're not going to know? By the way, speaking of flooding, what happened in Kentucky? Kentucky's still underwater. Joe then finally found out, oh, oh, I heard that they had a little rain down in Kentucky. <laughs> Notice it says that Biden... <laughs> to Kentucky after catastrophic flood. <laughs> really? <laughs> Are you serious? Hey, man, by the way, I know I kind of joke and I complain that nobody's watching the show and I want more people to watch the show, but you ever heard the phrase, Big Brother's watching? 
I'm going to tell you who's watching. That dude right there. Remember what we said last week? Remember what I told you? That, that, that Joe was having a problem remembering how to blink? Remember I showed you the side-by-side -side pictures of them eyes and I told you that wasn't the same person? Well, evidently, Joe ain't figured out how to blink yet because ever since then, put that picture back up there. Joe been coming up looking like the Terminator. They just told him, Joe, put this on. Who, am I the Terminator? They're like, yeah, Joe, you're the Terminator. Am I going to be back? <laughs> yeah, you'll be back, Joe. Republicans like, over our dead body. <laughs> the hell you say? Also, real quick on some news, man. Um, hey, man. Has anybody heard this? That Transformers are in a shortage in the United States. Uh, Transformers are, I think they're, I heard that they're like two years on back order. Uh, the Transformers that need, that that are, that if you need a Transformer, they're being repaired and there's no Transformers and we're coming up on the hurricane season. So just think about that. Just think about that. They're telling you about high gas prices. They're telling you about there's no food on the shelves. They're talking about there's no baby formula. You know, now if you want baby formula, you've got to run to the border. That's the only place they have it. But man, listen to me, man. They're already saying to you that there are no transformers. If you don't get, and I'm not talking about, I'm not talking about the robot transformers. I'm talking about the, tra the real transformers that make the lights come on. Also, what else did I forget to talk about? That's everything. Oh, shoot. I forgot to talk about the monkey pox. There we go. <laughs> I'm sorry. I didn't make this headline up. I didn't make it up. Gay men are lining up as early as 2 a.m. for the monkeypox vaccine. And it said that many of them are leaving empty-handed. No pun intended. All right, man, look. Here's a little Jim Spiracy for you, okay? And, and I'm serious. Just check this out. I'm telling you ahead of time, okay? We did that, 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 that COVID thing didn't do like they wanted it to do. It scared us for a minute, but it didn't scare us like it was supposed to, okay? America's very, very, very vain. Hollywood is very, very, very vain. And remember when the COVID thing was coming out? We, you know, uh, 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 stars was lining up. Oh, uh, I have COVID. Oh, uh, I have COVID. You know, Flavor Flav passed out on stage. He got COVID. Who's going to be the first star to step up and say, I have monkeypox? Uh oh, uh oh. Uh. What the hell is that on your hands, girl? Uh-oh. Hey, man, are we taking a look at this monkeypox? Are we seeing what's going on? I think when America starts seeing the results, all it takes is one of your partners to come down with monkeypox, and it's going to be a game changer. I'm going to be honest with you. I think that the monkeypox is disrespectful as hell to monkeys. Y'all blamed monkeys for everything. Y'all blame monkeys for AIDS. Y'all act like monkeys is the nastiest animals in the jungle. What about goats? Y'all act like just because somebody went out and had a little one night affair with a monkey, all hell break loose. Tell me something, man. I'm from Kansas City. Kansas, wheat fields. I have yet 
to ever hear a farmer say that he got the sheepy pox. Seriously, you go up and ask the sheep right now and you say, D -d -d what happened? The sheep be like, wasn't bad. I'm sorry. Take that out. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I couldn't resist it. Anyway, man. Y'all seen our studio poll for tonight? What y'all think about Harry Potter? You thought I was kidding about that, didn't you, Chris? Just harmless fun for kids. Really? I'm going to tell you right now, <laughs> I think it's entry level sorcery, but who am I? Then there's also a little thing down there for other, you know, because some of y'all like to dress your kids up like Harry Potter and send them out in the streets in Halloween like a little bag of bond and beg for candy. But you say it's okay. The reason that we're doing this Harry Potter poll tonight is because of our guest our guest tonight our guest tonight he found his 15 minutes of fame he acquired his 15 minutes of fame by banning harry potter books in the school that he was a principal he took he took the job and he said that uh he said that an exorcist told him to remove the Harry Potter books. Now, I shouldn't have told y'all that. Because I'm going to ask him who was the father, who, who was the exorcist that told him to remove the Harry Potter books. I want to know how that whole conversation went down. But uh, honestly, uh, Father Dan Rahill is a very, very, very interesting guy. I call him the priest of Wall Street. This dude went from Wall Street to priesthood. He went from having everything to having nothing and going on the road, going on the journey, listening to God. I got to give him credit for that. He hosts a podcast, Battle Ready. He has tons of knowledge about miracles. He's a big proponent of the fact that, that we could possibly be living in the ends of, time, ends of times. So you kind of see how that whole thing just rolled together. Remember what I said, how I was feeling and I was kind of feeling kind of bad about this journey. Now God going to send somebody here on the show tonight to give me a testimony about their journey. And I can't wait. Thank you all for joining me. Let's have some fun. Let's be blessed. Hit that music. The Exorcist. It's not just the name of one of the most frightening movies of all time, it's an actual job title. The casting out of demons has been part of the Judeo-Christian tradition for millennia. And just when exorcisms had seemingly been cast into the dustbin of history as the world entered modernity and the sexual revolution, the film starring Linda Blair and Max von Sydow brought exorcists back in front of the world in the 1970s. That movie, and the book it was based on, came from a true story of a little boy who had played with a Ouija board, and soon found himself in his own personal hell. But is the movie an accurate depiction of an actual exorcism? What are the dangers that lead to demonic possession? Is it true that occult practices, or even seemingly innocent books about witches, like the Harry Potter series, can put people in spiritual danger? when the story of a Catholic priest removing Harry Potter books from the school library made national headlines in 2019, the priest, Father Dan Rehill, 
said he did so at the advice of an exorcist. What was not known at the time was that Rehill, who was so ridiculed by the mainstream media, was himself an exorcist. Tonight, for the first time, he will tell his side of the story exclusively to the Jim Spiracy audience and give a bit of the background that led him to his current job title in Nashville, Tennessee, The Exorcist. Welcome back to Jim Spiracy. I'm your host, James D. Dodds. I feel better now. I've had to calm down. I've had to put on, I have company. I have a special guest in the house tonight. And my guest is Father Dan Rehill. Thank you for having me. And Dan is my actual first in-studio guest. And my, my, my first in-studio guest being a father, I think that's pretty good. All right, that, that, that's a good way to start it off. That is a good way. <laughs> Sir, thank you so much for joining us on the show. You're welcome. Go ahead. I did your story, No Justice, in the opening. Tell, t tell us your story. Give a, get, to tell us about your background and how you went from Wall Street to the Lord Street. Well, I mean, it's a little bit of a long story, but basically I was uh, born in 65 um, in New York. So, you know, growing up, I um, this is going to sound weird for people who didn't live in New York for their whole life. But back in the 70s and the 80s, Donald Trump was an icon in New York and he was loved by the people. He was loved in rap music. He he was he was amazing. If anything needed to be fixed, he would jump in and fix it. You know, I remember when the skating rink was broken for years, like three years, the, the city couldn't fix it. He said, "You know, my kids want to skate. Just let me do it. I'll pay for it, and it'll be done." He did it in like two months. Rink is back open. Mm -hmm. So that's how he was. So I, when other people wanted to grow up and be like astronauts and football players and whatever, I wanted to grow up and be Trump. You know, he he was powerful. He had a lot of money. He always had beautiful women on his arm. I said, that's who I want to be. Okay. So I went off to make my way eventually into New York City after college, um, worked in the financial district with uh, Amex and Citicorp. Um, and basically, life was really great according to the world's standards, but I wasn't very happy uh, because I didn't have God in my life. Okay. And then 9-11 uh, happened, and I I was, you know, I had an office in the center for three years. I wasn't there at the time, uh, but I knew a lot of the people. And so that was kind of a, a point in my life when I was uh, discerning, what do I want to do with my life? Uh, and by the time 9-11 had happened, I'd already di discerned that, you know, I, what happened was I went to a place called uh, Bosnia, okay. where the Blessed Mother was allegedly appearing, and I... I heard about that. had to go back so i had to go to confession i knew before i could go to church so i found this priest who i call the hollywood priest um who's smoking a cigarette making jokes for all the ladies and he heard my 20-year confession and then uh said to me you know i think you 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 might have a vocation to be a priest and i said no way not possible and i don't think you understand english because if you understood english you would have heard the confession was pretty deep so he just said, anything's possible with God. So that's the first time somebody said that to me. Um, and then I, uh, after 9-11, my apartment was only five blocks from the Trade Center. So closed, you couldn't go. Can I interrupt you for yeah, a second? Yeah, of course. How did you avoid? What, what, what? How did you just happen to avoid if you were that close and you worked there? Uh, I mean, you just happened to not work there. Oh, I, I was in Pennsylvania that day. Okay, okay. Uh, visiting a group of religious that I was c considering joining. So, so you just happened to be away? I was away, yes. Okay. Yeah. Uh, my brother was there. He's a New York City uh, fire captain at the time. Uh, and so our, our fact, my dad's a battalion chief. My grandfather is a lieutenant. So all these firemen and my cousins were all cops. Did you so, lose any family members? Not family members, no. But friends? A lot of friends uh, and a lot of my brother, you know, dozens and dozens of firemen that he knew. I was in law enforcement at oh, yeah? that time. 
Yeah. So I understand what you mean. I'm yeah, sorry. It was, it was yeah, ahead. it was a strange time. So anyway, I I wound up finding my way up to Boston. A priest invited me to go up to Boston, and so I went up to Boston and uh, I stayed there about nine months. And a very dynamic priest who lived the gospel. You know, he was an amazing man, still is, um, and he really showed me how to. Um, get closer to God and how to love God's people the okay. way God wants us to love God's people, you know, like really caring for them. And I, I was just amazed, you know, the, I got up there on September 29th and uh, by the new year, there was a big blizzard and all the networks were saying, don't leave your homes. You could die. And he says, come on, we're going out. And we got in his Jeep and we went right riding around the neighborhoods, picking up homeless people and bringing them back to the church. We did this for hours till we couldn't find any more. And then he went home and made homemade meatballs and spaghetti. And he fed everybody, prayed with all of them, gave them blankets, turned the heat up. Uh, I told them not to leave till the storm passed. In the morning, there'd be breakfast. And I remember when we got home to the rectory, I said, I didn't know priests could do this. I've never seen a priest do something like this. Why aren't the, all the other churches doing this? And he said, it's very easy because we have the gift of poverty. And we're not afraid of getting our candlesticks stolen. He said a lot of churches, they won't open their doors to the homeless because they're afraid that they'll get robbed. But I said, um, but these people could die. He's like, that's right. That's why we took them in. So he was just different. He was really different. And I stayed with him for, like I said, nine months. And then I eventually went off to seminary from there. And uh, it was a long path. It took me 12 years to get ordained. But, um, but God got brought me where I, I know he wanted me to be, and that's right here in Tennessee. Okay, and you got to Tennessee, and somehow or another you became a principal. Is that right? No. <laughs> well, wait, wait. Well, what happened? I, I hold it now. I, I, what happened with you and the Harry Potter and the library and the school? Oh, I was a pastor that had a school under... See, oh, I see, was over the that, that, that goes to show my religion and what that's I understand. Fine. Yeah. You... Okay, explain that. Explain that. So the pastor is the head of the whole parish, including the school. And mm -hmm. so I had a school, grammar school. Um, we were moving the library from the basement to the first floor because there was no elevator. And a lot of, constantly the kids are getting, you know, there's always kids with broken legs and crutches, and it was hard for them to get down. And the basement was kind of... Wait a minute, wait a minute. For the father, why? Now, no, no, you don't just have a whole bunch of kids with broken legs. Now, what, you, what happened? No, no, no. Why, how did the kids got all, a bunch of broken legs? All the time. <laughs> kids are always falling down, playing sports. I mean, I, I heard that the, I heard the Catholic Church was rough, but no, now, no, no, wait no, a minute. No, now, hold on. No, we don't touch the kids. <laughs> okay, they do it all right. Okay. Uh, <laughs> all right, I'm sorry. Yeah. Go ahead. And so in the process of moving the library, you know, it's a natural part of the process to go through the books and pull out stuff that you feel is old and maybe not being read uh, and replace it with newer stuff. Every library in the world does this because right. there's just not enough room to hold every book, right? And we had limited space. And as a process, I noticed there was quite a few books, um, Harry Potter, there were other things too. There were Stephen King books. Can you imagine for a fifth grader pulling out a Stephen King book? So there was a lot of strange books. I said, "These we don't need these. We need more books on the lives of the saints. We need more books uh, about you know healthy uh, stories." So anyway, it wasn't supposed it wasn't supposed to be public knowledge. But one of the teachers had a child who loved Harry Potter, and she wanted to know where the books went. I just said, "We we we pulled them. We got rid of these books. We don't. I don't feel like we need them in the school. You want to read Harry Potter? You can do it at home with your own book." Well. Somebody leaked it to the press and eventually it went out to the whole world and became a giant storm of controversy for not just me, but also for the diocese. And um, took a while. It took probably about two months for that to blow over. The, the Catholic school, uh, what was that? Put that back up there, Deuce. Uh, so I can read what that just said. Uh, it was the headline from said the Catholic school priest bans Harry Potter on a exorcist advice. Uh, th th this, this is uh, one of your headlines. Mm -hmm. um, I find that amazing, first of all, because... I didn't ban anybody. Yeah. I simply <laughs> removed the books because we had a limited space, and that was just not a book I thought was... So why, why did the headline say you banned it? 
well, they can the news writes whatever they want. But but you see how that, that that's what I'm getting at right there. Oh I mean, yeah, no, they they really they don't investigate any stories. Nobody called me and asked me what happened. Um, if I'm right here on this note here, our our question, our Twitter poll question for the show today is: Harry Potter, is it harmless fun for kids, or is it entry level sorcery or other? That, that, that's our question. That, that's yeah. my question mm-hmm. as far as Harry Potter. Well, you know, let, let, let's just cut to sure. it. What, what's your take on it? Okay. Well, I'm an exorcist and I spoke with several other exorcists and there's no exorcist that would allow those books in their school because the problem that I have with the books is they try to depict evil as being, uh, as witchcraft as being evil and then also good. Right, so there's the good, there's the good witchcraft, and then there's the bad witchcraft. That's that's not true. That's a lie. There is no good witchcraft because you're tapping into the demonic. So I don't want kids thinking they can try to, you know, ask these spirits to come help them when it's that's not a good. That's not the holy. The only good spirit is the Holy Spirit. Okay, and these demonic spirits are not good. Uh, so that's my first issue with it. The second one is. In each book, it progresses darker and darker into this. Uh, it's almost like they're glorifying the darkness. Mm-hmm. Also, not good, right? We mm-hmm. glorify God. That's the only one we give our glory to. And finally, um, several of the spells in those books were, were real spells. They weren't just made up. They were actual old spells that she had put into the book. So you could be invoking harm by saying these spells. It's it's like when we make, when we make the sign of the cross, we're, we're asking the Trinity to be present with us, right? We're invoking him. The demons do the same thing. So I just said, look, I'm not going to give you a treatise. I'm not going to speak to the school and give them a whole, you know, explanation on why I don't like the books. I just said, I'm choosing to not have them. That's all. And I didn't want, I didn't want it to be a big thing. I wanted to just put them away and they're gone, but it didn't go that way. I I find it amazing. Uh, First of all, let me say that Growing up, well, I'm not growing up, but when the Harry Potter fad came along, it didn't take long for me as a parent to go, nope. And I mean, I think, I mean, and only my reason for no was because it contained words like sorcery Mm -hmm. and wizards. And, you know, it talked about spells. I mean, what's it about? You know, and it, 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 well, then that's a no for my family. That's a no in my home. Mm-hmm. And there were kids by the groves. I mean, just Harry Potter, Harry Potter. They had Harry Potter fan clubs. And I oh, mean, yeah. this thing was, you know, this, this, Ameri- this thing took over our kids, not in just America, but all over the world. Well, the other thing you have to ask yourself about uh, when when you see somebody rise in fame so quickly, so this woman who wrote the books. I'm so glad you went to She that. had about 200 bucks in her bank account. There it is. And then she suddenly is worth hundreds of millions of dollars. That that doesn't happen by accident. And, and I'm not going to say she made a pact with the devil, but something went on there that influenced, maybe it influenced her writing. You know, we say that the Bible is inspired by the Holy Spirit. The devil can inspire as well. So I'm not saying that's what happened. I'm just saying you have to pause when you see something like that and say, what happened here that suddenly this exploded on the world in such a fast and pronounced way? Well, uh, that's exactly the story I heard. That's exactly the way I heard it. And I also heard that at some point she made the announcement that she was done. She wasn't writing anymore, okay? Now, I don't know how true this is, but I heard that recently within, I don't know how long ago, but now all of a sudden, she's in she's in trouble with the LGBT community or whatever. Uh, now, now she's falling out of yeah, because the good graces with Hollywood. There's a hierarchy of, of, what, of what they want to promote. Wow. And that agenda is... Uh, further up the totem pole than the witchcraft stuff. Say that again. 
So when you look at the way the culture is uh, driven, and it, it is driven, you know, it, it's not by chance that things just come up and go down. So I would say that LGBTQ whatever agenda is much higher up on the totem pole than the witchcraft agenda, because that's what they're siding with. And because she's going against it, she's being canceled. That's kind of exactly what I was kind of going for. Um, let me keep going here with this. I don't want to stay on this because uh, one of the things that uh, you are, and I kind of argued about this, but you are Nashville's exorcist. Is that right? I, I am. Nashville's, so you got a problem in Nashville. You yeah. need the exorcist. This is the guy. Yeah. Okay. Kentucky to Alabama. Um, I ne okay, now. I'm, I'm gonna, I gotta tell you this because when Chris said, hey, in, instead of just announcing you as father, he says, we have the exorcist priest. No, no, I don't like that. That's scary. Well, and that's me. That was like, yeah. I, don't, I don't like that. <laughs> it shouldn't be, but for some people it is. Well, I mean, I'm just saying the way I was raised up. But l l let's talk about something because I, I didn't get a chance to really get into this, but I would like to talk about, and this is something my producer and I talked about. Can we talk about the stages of demonic activity? Yeah, there are. Yeah, there's different levels. Uh, we have a graphic here. Uh, I'm going to turn this around here to you. And it talks about the five stages of demonic, demonic actions. Mm -hmm. Number one, it talks about temptation. Number, number two is infestation. Number three is oppression obsession and possession okay can you break that down and yeah, tell me what's going on there yeah okay they're not actually stages because they, they don't they can all stand alone in fact okay. um so there's two ways the demons operate they operate in their natural capacity and then they operate in a supernatural capacity 99% of demonic activity in the world is in this natural capacity. What is that? That's temptation. So they tempt us, uh, even in some kinds, of, so, sometimes even strange ways that, you know, you'll just finish saying, you know what? Uh, it could be something as silly as, uh, I'm not going to, I'm not going to have a drink for the month of August. And as soon as you, you tell this to the Lord, as you, some kind of a fast you're doing, uh, the phone will ring and it'll be one of your best friends. Hey, let's go out to the bar tonight. I just got a job. Just got to, we're got to go out and yeah. celebrate, buddy. Yeah. So that's what I mean by the natural. Uh, to, and by the way, the sin is the only thing that will put you in hell. So the supernatural power of demons. So that would be infestation. Infestation is when they kind of uh, are, are ruling within a house or a place Okay. And they can uh, move things around the house. They can uh, bang on the walls. They can give the odor of uh, rotten eggs. They can drop the temperature in the room 30 degrees. All these sorts of things we would call an infestation. But they're not actually messing with the people. They're just putting fear in the people because all the things they're doing in the house. Then there's obsession. Obsession is when they uh, mess with somebody's mind. And they attack their thoughts all day. And they can be, this can drive people crazy because all they hear are these voices screaming in their head all day long. Uh, oppression is attacks to the body. So the person's body is physically attacked. Sometimes it manifests with a sickness that can't be diagnosed. Uh, other times it's, you can say right away, you know, it's evil. I had uh, a case where uh, a gentleman lived alone in his own home. And he was waking up in the morning with bite marks all over his body. Well, he can't bite himself on the back. So we knew it wasn't him. Uh, other times, uh, the scratch marks, all sorts of strange things. So, the, And then possession is when the person gives their will over to the spirit and kind of gives into it. And then it can take control of their whole person. Okay. I want to I add something to this topic of... People, hold on. Let me let me go back for a minute, if I may. Sure. Because some of the things you, one of the things you talked about, and everyone's familiar with this. For everyone that's seen the movie The Exorcist, 
So those are things that we've seen. Mm -hmm. um, first of all, let's talk about, let's just say the movie, because the movie, The Exorcist, just a movie, right? But bad things happen to on the set of that movie. Mm -hmm. Okay. Can you just speak on that real quickly? Just on just on that. I don't want to once again, it, you know, Hollywood is trying to glorify something that's evil. Right. So right away, you're on bad footing. Um, not everything in the movie happened in real life. And they kind of um because they only have an hour and a half to show the movie, they kind of condense the events together. So it's it, it seems a lot worse when you watch the movie. Here's another thing. When I go into an exorcism, I don't go to somebody's house at midnight and during a rainstorm to do the exorcism. You know, nobody does that. You do it during <laughs> the day when it's the sun is out. You do it in the church where, where I would have the Blessed Sacrament present. I would have other people with me, a team, and it's structured going into somebody's home that you've never been in the middle of the night during a thunderstorm that's a that's absurd but that's the way they depicted it okay um i'm gonna throw one more movie at you because the movie poltergeist i don't um people every i don't want to say everybody but people that actors in that movie ran into strange fates in other words hollywood plays with the devil and things happen. Well, the devil never plays. He's never playing. You know, like you can think you're putting your mouth in the lion as, and the lion is, thinks it's part of a trick. It, that lion never thinks it's a trick. He takes everything he can. So you don't, you don't play games. You know, another example uh, is the Ouija board. <laughs> so, so people would think, oh, it's just a game. What's the harm? And they also have, what I say is curiosity is not a virtue. A, a, a curiosity about the demonic it can get you in big trouble. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Um, now, I, I want to go somewhere with this because, and I, I asked this question, and, and truthfully, I, I'm, I'm going to bring race into this, okay? Mm -hmm. Because in the black community, like I just said, we don't play. We don't play about that. We don't play about demonic spirits and this and this. But I think that's very interesting. I think it's very, very interesting. Even if we look at it in the terms of what you say as far as the five stages of being uh, uh, of demonic. Can we put that back up one more time, please? Because when I looked at that and I looked at some of those stages, uh, temptation, infestation, oppression, obsession, those are some of the things that, I mean, I would love to say that, I mean, yes, it affects everybody, but it really affects black people, it affects the black culture. And especially when you talk about oppression, because, you know, we, we love to say, oh, we are oppressed. Well, yeah, there's been an evil placed upon you. Mm -hmm. There's an evil placed upon us. And if you don't address it and look at it like it's an evil, if you try to take it and play with it like it's something else, you might not get out from up under that, okay? And, and one of the things that's happening with my people is we've been taught that God isn't real. Oh, and in the process of saying God isn't real, mm -hmm. then you're saying that the devil is real. You know, that will, as black people will, we, we won't claim God. We, you know, guys, that's the white man's God. And low key, we started claiming the devil. And the reason I'm saying this is in our music, especially in the rap R&B music. I just did something two weeks ago and I was talking about the singer Beyonce. And if we could, I'm going to turn this around to you here. I want you, if you could just look at this for me. You see here, Beyonce, she's got this little satanic ring on her finger, mm -hmm. you know, and, and she just did an album. There she is. She's throwing up the little demonic sign. Mm -hmm. uh, I talked about on her album. We didn't realize it, but at one point she did four album covers. She was on a red horse, a black horse, a white horse, and a pale horse.
you know, and I find that to be nothing. What is that? Tell me, what is that? What's happening? I find that to be demonic. I find it, and, and, and nobody thinks it's real. So if you don't think it's real, isn't that the devil going unchecked? Is that not the devil just running rampant? Yeah, the, the two mistakes people make with the devil is they either say he's everywhere and he's the cause of every problem, or they say he doesn't exist at all. The virtue lies in the middle. This is a real person. I say person meaning uh, uh, somebody that has a will and a, and a, and a force, uh, but he's a spirit, pure spirit. So much more powerful than man. And Lucifer was the most brilliant and beautiful of all the angels before he fell. So he's someone to contend. We can't beat him in a fight. It's only God that can beat him. So your relationship with God is going to be your strength. So that's that makes me very sad to hear that people are saying they don't believe in God because that's the one who can help them against these very evil forces. But, Pastor, nowadays we're hearing music just blatantly saying that they're God. Yeah, I I'm God. Um, your God, Jay-Z, says that if your God up there is bigger than my God down here, then who shall I fear? Uh, you know, they, they're they're blatantly telling kids this. Yeah. Uh, well, we have a show. How many years has American Idol been on TV? American Idol. What, what was the God problem say? in the Old Testament? Thou they were worshiping not, idols. <laughs> thou shalt not have another God before me. Wow. Yeah. yeah. So we've got Hollywood's always been under the control of, of, of Lucifer. Jesus himself said, uh, the world is under the control of, of the devil. I mean, that was out of God's mouth. So it shouldn't surprise us that places that have particular power with messaging, with uh, music, which goes right to the heart, music bypasses the brain, goes straight into the heart, good and bad, uh, that would be, you know, something that he would want to control, right? Right. Yeah. Well, look at these people. Um, Lady Gaga has a story that she was down on her luck playing the Bowery for, you know, 100 bucks a night. She went out to get some more drugs, meets this beautiful man who says, do you want it all? And she says, what, what do you mean all? He says, fame, fa fame, fortune, and money, power. And she said, yes. He said, just worship me. And within a month, she had her first number one hit. And then it's been um, a huge career ever since. How do how, I don't think people take it Katie seriously? Perry. Katie, yeah, she's got issues too. She she came up she came up in a Christian home. Right. And she told you blatantly that she uh made a she 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 blatantly made a decision. Uh, so so basically this this deal of selling your soul, meeting at the crossroads. This is not just something that's fictitious, because yeah. I mean. So yeah. I guess the question is, because some people will say that, oh, you can't, God owns your soul. So you, you know, the devil, you can't give the devil your soul. Can the devil, can the devil, can you write a check and the devil come and come and, well, come and cash the in? The problem on is by colluding with the devil, you're directly working against God. And so at the, if you do that your whole life, at the end of your life, why would you think you're going to heaven? You're going to go where you've been your whole life. And in that way, he kind of does have them in a snare because at the end of life, if they've been serving the devil their whole life, that's where they're going. They're going to hell. And that, that way he does kind of snare them. Does he own their soul? No, but now he gets to torment it for eternity. Even worse. So people have to realize, uh, and the, the funny thing about this country is everybody wants the big payout. You know, we're all after money. And we're after the big home and the fancy cars. And the Gospels continually tell us that's the hard road that's not leading to heaven. So, like, we, we wish for the things that are actually going to complicate our lives and potentially lose our eternal place in heaven. Right? It's harder for a rich man. I survived. Oh, man, that's exactly. And it, it's the road to hell is a super highway and the narrow gate going to heaven. Few people walk it. That's what Jesus said. He told us. Few people are taking the narrow gate. I, I think that the more money you make, the more sins you will commit in order to hold on to it. 
Well, it's not just holding on to it. Here's the problem with a lot of money. You know, like we just had the um, the Mega Millions. Okay. One point three billion dollars. Right. I would never buy a ticket for anything. <laughs> what would it do to your life? It would. You wouldn't have a life. You would have to build a castle and change my phone number. Everything, right? Uh, but that people went out in droves trying to get that ticket. Here's the, here's the big thing. Um, if you if you don't believe there's a God, you're already got one foot in the grave because in so many ways today, the Lord is trying to reveal himself to humanity. 200 years ago, if you grew up in say a little town in the middle of nowhere, maybe in the middle of Alaska, and no one ever told you about Jesus Christ, that might be an argument to say, I didn't know, no one taught me. But you can't do that anymore because there's just too much information out there. There's too many ways to understand. I mean, you see churches on every, especially in Tennessee, there's a church on every corner. So you can't go through your whole life ignorant and claim that as the reason you don't know. I love that. You can't go through your life. Actually, in law enforcement, we have a phrase that says ignorant is no excuse for the law. So I think that's the same thing. Exactly. Um let me ask you, if I may, ask you about a couple more things. And I just talked to you about Beyonce and her appearing on the Ford, you know, on the red horse, the white horse, the black horse and the pale horse. Can you, I know it's a shame to say, can you quickly kind of just break down the four horsemen and what that talks about or just what does that represent? Well, they're, in, they're of the apocalypse. Okay. So they're bringing... Uh, death, disease, and pestilence upon the world. Is that something you want to be associated with? <laughs> Why would you? <laughs> you know what I mean? So it is a little odd to me, but I'll tell you, I, just, I don't know Beyonce. I don't know anything about her really. And and I don't want to speak about somebody I don't know. I, I've never even seen the images because I don't, I don't have any of that. And I'm sorry if I let but, you look at it. No, no, no. no it's, it's, I don't care. Uh, but when I, in New York, there was uh, an exorcist in New York City. His name was Father Jim Labar. He told me a very interesting story about a musician. So this girl was a Juilliard, uh, young Filipino girl, Catholic. And she was a violinist, gifted, gifted violinist. And it was time to graduate and, and all these people getting job offers and she wasn't really getting any. And she was constantly heard saying, I would do anything to be famous. People heard her say that. Anything, imagine that. So uh, one night she goes to bed, she has a dream and in the dream, this beautiful, beautiful naked man comes to her and says, do you want to be famous? And she says, I do. And he pulls out a contract and he cuts her finger and says, sign it in your blood. So she signs it and she's the contract with his finger and it explodes into flames and falls on the floor as ashes. Now you can deduce from that dream, she Basically, like, that's that classic, I sold my soul for fame, right? Well, here's the problem. When she woke up the next morning, her finger was cut and the ashes were on the floor. Now, at this point, you would think you would call your priest and say, I think something happened here. But she doesn't tell anybody. And then within weeks, she's picked up for a, a world tour and she makes a ton of money. And in that circle becomes very famous. Here's the money now. The money comes it's involved with drugs and then she starts using needles and then she gets hiv and now she's dying of aids in a hospital in new york city and she remembers how this all started and she calls her mother and says come here i have to tell you something she tells her very devout catholic filipino mother the story of the beautiful man and the contract and so the mother calls the chancery in new york city and says i need the exorcist and they send father labar and so father okay. labar shows up he hears the whole story and says, hmm, doesn't sound good. Uh, I think what you need to do is you're going to have to write out the whole creed of what we believe, and then you're going to have to cut your finger and sign that in blood. Well, the doctors don't like this. She has AIDS. They don't want her cutting her finger and bleeding all over the place. Uh, but eventually he prevails, and she does it. And as soon as she signs it, she codes and violently goes into convulsions on the table and then dies. Oh, now the doctors are pointing fingers. <laughs> Great story there, they're Father. Pointing, Thanks. They're pointing fingers at the priest. The mother's hysterical. Everybody's screaming and yelling. This went on for about 10 minutes. And then all of a sudden, 
she jumps up off the table. She's back. And she's fully alive. <coughs> I'd have ran into a concrete wall. And they test her. No HIV, no AIDS. She's cured as well. So that young woman decided from that day forward, she was now had to tell the world that the devil's real. You don't make any bargains with him. And you have to get close to Jesus Christ. Changed her whole life. Changed Father Labar's life too. <laughs> wow. And first of all, that God is good. That the, the, Those are the stories that I think we need to hear in life. One of the things that I think that our young people miss is they don't have any faith. Mm -hmm. They don't have any, you know, they, there's no stories like that. You know, all they hear is the American Idol stories, the Beyonce. I mean, that, that's all they know. That, that They don't hear, there, there's not enough stories about enough miracles mm -hmm. going on. Um, right now we have your, uh, 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 your, your Joel Osteen's. You, you know, they, everything that they preach about is prosperity and everything's going to be fine. And, and, and you know, you, that, that, that's not how that works. That, that, that's not what God says is going to happen. Mm -hmm. And I don't I think that you I think that's an, that's unjust to tell a well, Christian. It's a lie. It's a lie. <laughs> and so who's the father of lies? That's Satan. right. Listen, uh, the prosperity happens in heaven. Mm. Your greatest day on earth will pale in comparison to your worst day, if there could be a worst day in heaven. Mm. But there is no bad days in heaven. And listen, if Jesus Christ is God himself, and he never did one thing wrong, he never hurt anybody, he never had to apologize once, and he was murdered violently, where's the prosperity there? Okay. I mean, he, his whole life was basically poor. I mean, he wasn't uh, desolate, but they, they, they had a modest upbringing. They had to flee to another country, probably lived in a hovel in Egypt. They didn't, what did not they take with them? And then his whole ministry years, he was just kind of on the road. He'd sleep here and there. It didn't seem like he had a home. So, uh, and he also said, pick up your cross daily and follow me. His words, not mine. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So it doesn't sound like he's promoting the house parties and the yachts and the fancy cars. That, that was not what he came to tell us to do. It's all about love, sacrificial love, and relationships. Those are the things that are the most important. Um, let me ask this question because I think that when we talk about exorcisms and demonic possessions and you know, there there becomes a Hollywood twist that we put to this, and we say that you know, are there times that are there are there times that you've looked at something or you've heard about something on the news or you've read about something and you've heard the media say mental illness, alcoholism, drug addiction, but you could tell from the story that now nah, that person was possessed. Yeah, I mean, I mean, does when, that make you, sense? Did yes. I say that correctly? When you see stories of somebody, you know, killing their whole family, or these people who just shoot up random people, um, they could have some mental illness, but there's definitely spirits there. They hide under the mental illness. You know, an interesting thing is there's that manual used for some, like the the DSM, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual for diagnosing mental illness. Mm -hmm. I think they're up to version eight. So when I was in college, I was DSM three. I have a psych major. Um, possession has never been in that book until the latest version. They finally put it in because I think during COVID, they saw things that they just simply couldn't put in any bucket. What did COVID do for by people it, being it, in the home, not being it able went, to get... It, it spiked. The demons went through the roof. The cases tripled and they're harder to deliver. So what used to be a one and done now takes two, three, four times. So the cases just back up. So I have another priest now that helps me. He's he, his, he's also an exorcist in Nashville. But um, so the church says, I have to have moral certitude that there is the presence of a demon in order to do an exorcism. Moral certitude. So that's kind of a funny phrase. It means I have 100% conviction that this is a spirit. So typically we do ask everybody before the rite of exorcism, they have to get a psychological exam done 
because that helps us determine and weed out if there is some mental illness there. However, I had a case where I went to go meet with somebody who was possessed, full on possession. And as I started praying with him, he levitated off the couch. He's now floating in the air. Guess what? I have moral certitude. That's a spirit. That's not a mental illness. Mental illness can't make you levitate. You think? I think. <laughs> okay, and see, that, and this is why I work in a jail and you do exorcisms because I can't I'm do that. I'm sure there's plenty I, of spirits I, I, in the jail. <laughs> wait a minute. Okay, look, I got to tell you a story. I, I wasn't going to. I never even told you this story. <laughs> Let me tell you a quick story. This is, has joking. Had an uh, inmate was, he was being. Um, he, he was acting up, yelling, screaming, acting out. He was placed in what we call the restraint chair. Mm -hmm. He's in the restraint chair. He's yelling, screaming. Ah! He'd been and he'd been going on for a while. And then I'm, I have to bring the nurse in to check on him every thirty minutes, you know, just mm -hmm. to make sure the straps aren't too tight. And I'm standing behind him with another nurse. We're standing behind him. He can't see me, and just out of nowhere, just, I just decided. Take the water and go. The power of Christ compels you. And I throw the through the water on him. This man almost came up out of this chair, <sighs> making a noise. I will never do it again. Mm. I was just joking, mm -hmm. just playing. And like I said, I was behind him. He was mm -hmm. the yelling, screaming he was going on. He had no idea what I was doing behind him. Mm -hmm. So yeah. as far as what you're saying, as far as, and, and, and one of the things is, is just speaking about spirits and just, you know, the, the, there's a lot of people that are, you end up finding yourself behind bars because a spirit got on you or got in you. Okay. Let me ask this. Are there people that can become possessed and the devil will make you do something or the spirit can make you do, and then you have then it, you have no idea that it happened. Is that possible or no? It is possible because sometimes they're not coherent when it's happening. Literally, their eyes roll back in their head. They don't know what's going on. And that's the danger. that They can get them to manipulate them to do to crime, right? To hurt people, to shoot people, mm -hmm. to uh, murder people, rape people. That can, that can all be manipulated by demons if the person is disconnected from God. I mean, this is why I keep going back to this. It's so important you have a really healthy relationship with Jesus Christ, and you're inviting him into your heart every day. You're enthroning him in your home. Like your home should be a witness that this is who I worship, and this is where he dwells in my home. And I go into some people's homes, and I go, what is all this stuff? Um, I didn't ask for that big green thing to be here. Okay, I just well, want you to know. That's Okay, uh, all right. I thought, okay, I thought, okay. But there are... <laughs> You know, certain things, you know, when you go, I go, what is like the, the dream catchers, all that stuff. That's I don't play not that. I don't good. play that stuff, man. Yeah. I, I, I don't play that. Um, I heard you say on another podcast that we are at the in, in our end times. Well, the end of this era. The end, end of this era. Could you elaborate on that, please? Well, I mean, I think we're heading into something. Uh, that's going to change the world for the better, but there's going to be a lot of strife to get to that point. So this is typical of how God works. You go back to the Old Testament with the Jews. They would go away from him. They'd stray away. He would give them a long time to come back. He would send them prophets saying, please come back or something bad will happen. And if they don't, like Nineveh, they repented and Nineveh was spared. Remember? Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, but often the 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 Israelites didn't, and then they they got beaten up bad. Sometimes they were taken into captivity by other kingdoms, and they were held as slaves. So he allows, in his mercy, he will allow a catastrophic event to happen to shake people out of their complacency and bring them back to reality. Like you need me. I am the one who protects you. You think you're protecting yourself. You don't know who you are. You're a creature. You're not a, You're not the creator. 
And that's where we are right now. So it would not surprise me in any way, shape or form if some large event comes to the planet worse than COVID that shakes it up to let people know you're not in control here. And then people will repent. If the people repent, God comes rushing back in always. He promises, I'll always take you back, but you must repent of your sinful ways. So the revelation will happen. The book of Revelation will happen. But that's not the end of the world. Mm -hmm. That's the end of this age of disobedience. And then there's a thousand year peace where I think the Holy Spirit will be reigning over the world and people will be in step with God's will. Uh, what would that look like? That'll almost look like heaven, but it won't be heaven. It'll still be earth. And every our father, we pray thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Well, Jesus didn't give us that prayer if he didn't mean it. Like it's going to happen. We're praying for that to happen, that God's will will be done on earth just like it's done in heaven. How do they do things in heaven when God gives a command? So God says to St. Michael, go here and go do this. Go down there and tell so-and-so, blah, blah, blah. Well, they do it immediately, they do it completely, and they do it joyfully. We don't really respond that way, really, to anybody. When we're told to do something, a lot of times we don't want to do it, or we don't do it at all, or we do it angrily, or with our teeth clenched. That's not how the angels and saints operate. They do it completely, joyfully, and immediately. So when the world starts responding to God in that way, that I think it's going to be that era of the Holy Spirit, the era of peace. Your podcast is called Battle Ready? Yes. Tell me about that. It's just out there to help people prepare for what's coming. Um, the Speaking of what's coming, uh, of course, everybody wants to know this, and I'm going to let... Uh, does Russia... Ukraine, China, are all of these things, are these, does this have anything to do with things wrapping up or are they isolated incidents? I, I don't know. Okay. I don't know. If the, you know, God does speak to me and tell me things, but it's more like uh, just trust in me, right. stay close to me. But he's never told me, you know, go out and buy like, a basement's worth of food to stock up. Right. There's, you know, like people are doing that. There are other people who, like the prepper people. Right. They seem to think something's coming, but I think it's bigger than that. I don't think you can outsmart what's coming. I think it's, I think the people who are dependent on God will be fine. It'll be uncomfortable and that we might see a lot of people perish. But the goal of this life isn't to stay here forever. <laughs> the goal of this life is to get to heaven. You know what? Everybody was running to get the vaccine to stay alive. Yeah, I'm not getting that. And I, I that thought to cool. myself, I, I mean, well, if God's ready for me to go, I mean, why? And I think that's why people were getting the shot, because you're not ready to go. You're not ready to meet him. So that's why you're trying to, you got some, you just got some things you want to do. <clears throat> um, one last thing before you go. Um. Let me just ask this. Why does God or does God? I don't want to say why. Why why in life do we see bad things happen to good people? Mm -hmm. We see bad things happen to yeah. innocent people. Mm -hmm. We see a school and we see babies being massacred in a school. Why does that allow to happen? Well, when God created everything and he made man and woman, there was no evil in the world. There was no death originally. It was only through the first sin that death entered the world. And he warned them. He said, do not eat of that tree. And it's interesting to me because God told that to Adam before Eve was made. So Adam is really the one who was responsible and it, maybe he told Eve, but it, where was Adam when I, Eve is having this dialogue? He should have been protecting his wife. Mm. I'm not trying to mm. pile on that. Adam, but I heard that. it makes you wonder, like, mm -hmm. this is, he was, she was given to you just for you. What, where are you? <laughs> She's having a problem with the serpent. Anyway, so uh, sin enters the world and, and death enters the world. Okay. Now, we have free will. The only way we can prove we love God is by obeying him, right? So the way Adam and Eve 
he could have given them a dozen rules to follow. He said, that, one, don't touch that tree. You can have everything else in the garden, but don't touch the tree. And by the way, everything grew on its own. You didn't have to cultivate. You didn't have to work for anything. It was paradise. But they went and got tripped up and they took the fruit. It said it looked, it was uh, beautiful to behold and pleasing to the eye. And the serpent says, um, did God really say that you can't eat of the fruit? And you know now she's in a dialogue with the devil. You're never going to win that way. And what what, what what when she reached for the fruit, she wanted to become like God because she was convinced he was holding out on them. That's what the serpent tricked them into. What do we have going on today? Everybody wants to be like God. We're going to define our own gender. Who does that? God does that. Everything we're doing, we're going to decide when life ends and, be, and and starts. No, God does that. But that's what we're doing as a as a race. But back to the whole point. The only way you can show him you love him is by choosing him. And to do that, you have to have a free will. And so the free will, if you're following it properly and you're listening to God and obeying him, you're going to be choosing the good. You're going to be choosing the blessing. I place before you... The blessing and the curse, death and life, choose life. Some people, though, choose the curse and death. And those people are going against God. And the reason they can do it and he doesn't stop them is because they have free will. He, he prizes free will as the preeminent gift that he's given us. It, the, when he says you're in my image and likeness, mm -hmm. that's the ability that we can, uh, we have... Uh, intelligence to rationalize and solve problems animals can't do that right and we have the ability to choose our free will one last thing father speaking of free will we have this big thing in the country now we talk about free will free gender free sexual whatever is your sexual preference how much of this sexual preference is evil Okay, this is a whole other show, but in a nutshell, um, the only way man participates in creation is through the sexual union of a man with a woman, a husband with a wife, okay? Yes, sir. That's the only way man participates in creation. We can chop a tree down and build a table out of it, but that's just taking one thing and turning it into another. We don't create anything. Only God creates. And so he gives the man and the woman the ability to cooperate in creating a new person that will never ever be gone. You know, after this life, that soul will live on for eternity in one or the other place. So it's you're creating something that will be on forever. That's the most sacred thing you can do on the planet after what we would call the sacrifice of the mass, which makes present Jesus on Calvary in an unbloody form in the Catholic Church. After that, it's this sacred act of this union, which is it's the giving of the man and the woman to each other the way God gave himself to his church. You know, he said, I will, I will lay down my life for you. I will die for you. And so that, that symbolizes that when they come together and God blesses that by bringing forth new life. Now, because it's so sacred, the devil has tried to twist this and mar it and make it um, vulgar. And that's why we have all this pornography mm. and, uh, and, and beyond pornography, it really weird stuff that goes into a uh, horrible, weird, painful things uh that's a he's trying to mock god the way he does it is through his children mm -hmm. and so when we start participating in the, in the whole idea that we can just have sex any way we want whenever we want and for our, only for our pleasure it's not tied to the act of bringing forth life anymore that's a grievous sin in god's eyes Whew. um you know i think one of the not i don't think uh, I think one of the greatest gifts that God gave us, I mean, of course, we say that's the woman, but I think the greatest gift that with God, uh, that God gave man was woman. But when you put the man and the woman together, you get the gift of a child. Mm -hmm. And I don't think that there's anything greater than the, 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 the meeting of the sperm, meeting the egg and that, that, that union and seeing God's work form of being but we live in a society that says that you can stop that you can stop great god's greatest creation how does that how, how's god feeling about that 
and we, I'm sure he's not happy. I mean, I mean, how, how, how do you how do you receive God's blessing as a country when you're killing his unborn babies? We're, we're under the curse. So 50 years ago, when that became a law over the country, we took the curse upon the country. We, we we've been in we've been in bad shape since then. Now, now that this has been undone, the states have the ability to take the curse upon themselves as a state because it's at the state level. But at least the country is, I think, undone from that curse. Um, but I've never seen the, the the degree of passion that people have to stop birth from happening, and and it, it does make you pause. Now, there's also an attack now on pregnancy centers. Did you know that? Yes. So they're angry at a place that will help a woman have a baby. Why? I thought you were choice. Somebody's making a choice to have a baby. Why are you so angry about it? Because they were never about choice. Never. Father, thank you so much. You're welcome. I, I appreciate you. I truly hope that you all out there have enjoyed this as, more, as much as I have. This is what I've wanted to do with this show. I just want to try to just be able to, you know, take what's going on in the world and just maybe just bring a little sense of something to it you know just maybe you know just may, maybe people will hear a little something and go huh i like what he's here's saying. the good news here it doesn't matter how rich or poor you are how smart you are where you came from where you're going if you stop right now and say i want jesus in my life and i'm willing to take you into my heart lord i want to know who you are he will come rushing in and, and he will put you on a path that'll give you a future full of hope that's available to anybody today Father, thank you so much. You're welcome. God bless you. Inspiring to save mankind forever. That's serious, man. That's what I'm about, man. I'm about the preservation of the motion of life. I want this thing to keep on going, man. Hey, I cannot thank Father Rehill so much. I cannot thank him enough for blessing us with his presence. That went, that went far better than I thought it was going to go. I knew something was going to fall off the wall or the chubacombra was going to jump through the window or something. I just knew that was going to go bad, but God is good all the time. And I really think that was a very enlightening conversation. And I hope that it touched some of you all like it touched me. Listen, I know it's been long. I'm going to get this over with. And I actually just said, hey, man, I don't want to do a Bible story. We just didn't want to get out of here. We, we, it's like, no, I have to do this Bible story. And I, I just have to. And, of course, you know that if I do a Bible story based off everything we talked about, man, I got to do a Bible story about the book of Job. And, you know, I remember I actually, <laughs> I actually got in trouble in school. I had a class called Bible literature and we was reading from the book of Job. And if you just look at that writing that we just put up of the book of Job, if you didn't know better, if you didn't know that you was reading from a Bible, what does that look like? It says, oh, damn it. It looked like it said job to me. I didn't know. It just looked like it said job. I didn't know. I guess job got to end at the end of it. <laughs> I didn't know. I went to a bad school. <laughs> hey, man, listen. Tonight's story, I'm going to talk about the story of Job from the book of Job. And I'm going to tell you straight up. I'm going to be honest with you. Honestly, this is the story in the Bible that I do not like. I don't like it. I don't like it. I don't like it. This is the only story in the Bible that make me look at God and be like, bruh, bro. I mean, really, what's going on? 
See, you have to listen to the story of Job, and you know, I'm gonna paraphrase a little bit, but basically the story of Job says that God was setting up, chomping it up with the devil. In other words, they setting up at, I ain't gonna say they was at a bar or a nightclub, but let's let's just say they were sitting up at Applebee's, chomping it up. And God asked the devil, like, hey, man, what's been up with you? How you been? And the devil's like, oh, man, I ain't been doing nothing, just chilling. He said, I'm just going to and fro, stepping from this life into the next, doing like I do, causing chaos, commotion, you know, out here taking these fool souls, you know. Then the devil kind of started getting a little little boisterous with God. He's like, hey, man, you know, it don't really take a whole lot to make your people sell out, man. Your, your, your people sell out at a drop of a hat. You know, he's like, you got to do better than that. And this is the problem. This, this is my problem because God said, I got one. I got, I got one you can't touch. He said, Job. He said, Job is my most trusting and loyal servant. But the devil like, yeah, he your tr most trusting and loyal servant, but you also done blessed Job. Job got more than anybody else. You done took care of Job. J Job is in the perimeters. He, he, he's behind the secure walls. So Job ain't got to worry about nothing. The devil told God, say, man, you let me, let, 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 let me at him. I'll make him curse you. I said, all right, you know, bet accepted. Go ahead. But he told him, he said, you can't, tr you can't touch him. Don't, don't put your hands on him. He said, all right. And so the devil steps out and does what he does, and he goes on into the steps back on the earth. The next thing we know, man, they say that Job lost it all. God told him, he said, you take everything from me. He said, but Job ain't going, he ain't going to curse me. Job lost it all. And he said, he ain't, he told him, he said, he's not going to blame God. But look here, man, a servant came in and told Job, he said, hey, man, all of your flock is dead. And I alone have escaped. Another servant came in, told him, he said, all your camels is dead. So I don't know what happened to him. I'm the only one that escaped. A storm came in. <clears throat> he lost his family. He lost everything, man. He lost everything. And I really just, I'm like, come on, man. And then after he lost everything, then he took sick. Man, you ever been doing bad and got sick? You ever been without a job and then all of a sudden you got sick and had to go have surgery? Hey, man, Job got so sick, man, he said that his flesh was falling off his bones. It was so, he, was, he got so sick, he said he was cutting this, he had to burn glass to cut his flesh. His partners came over to talk to him and his partner's like, oh, Joe, we don't know what you're doing, boy, but you done done something and God is punishing you. Go ahead. Tell, tell the truth, Joe. Tell the truth. Shame the devil. Go ahead, bro. I ain't going to tell your wife what you do. Joe say, man, y'all, you, you ever been sick and you got to just put people away from you because they talking crazy and it's making you feel worse? Joe said, hey, man, y'all got to go. And then sure enough, you know his wife is listening. His wife is like, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. You supposed to be God's favorite in it all. Don't look, I don't want no faith. If I was had to be God's favorite and be treated like that, I wouldn't want to be God's favorite. See, y'all need to listen to this because it was Job's wife who told Job, what you need to do you need to go ahead and go somewhere and curse God and die. The 
That's what the Bible said that she told Job. And I love what Job said. Job told her, said, woman, thou speaketh like a foolish person. And he told her, you can go ahead and step with everybody else. Because I'm not cursing God. Bottom line is what I'm telling you, Job never turned his back on God. And y'all know the story. God gave Job back everything and some. When I got my divorce, my mama told me, she said, baby, let all of this stuff go. She said, let it go. If it's meant to be, God's going to give it back to you in fold. And that's what I did. God gave it all back to me and in, in, in fold. Like you heard me ask, Father. Sometimes in life, good people going to suffer. Sometimes in life, I'm going to be sitting up waiting to see the bad people get theirs. But sometimes in life, it seems like bad people thrive. And they forget the prosperity of the, of the gospel. You know, but I'm here to tell y'all, man, justice will win in the end. I'm going to share one last story with y'all, just really quick, if I may, please. I just want to, I just want to round this up. My father died in a quadruple homicide. I think that's probably been about eight, nine years ago. And probably maybe one year before that, my little brother was found dead in his bed. So we had two major deaths. Like, I want to say like within a year and a half. And I remember talking to my stepmother. And I asked her, I said, Anita, what's going on? I said, what's, what's happening? Why is this going on? And I never will forget, man, this woman just lost her husband. She had just lost a son. And she said, Jimmy Dean, that ain't nothing but God showing you that he's still in charge. You know how powerful it is to say something like that? When you are actually going through it. And I thought about what she said. And when I thought about what she said, it kind of made sense to me. And at the funeral, I spoke and I told people about the conversation I had. And I remembered I asked God, why did you, what's going on, man? Why are you, why, why are you letting this happen? And I, re I remembered, I realized, remember when you was young? And remember when grown people would be talking? And you would come in and you would interrupt the conversation? Old people would tell you, stay out of grown folks' business. And I suddenly realized when I asked God, hey man, what's going on? God looked at me and said, stay out of grown folks' business. I got this. I'm going in hey, may the Lord watch between me and thee while we are absent one from the other. I'm going to see you next week on Jim Spears. You know. Give them what they want, what they need, what they ask for. Give them what they want, what they need, what they ask for. Yeah, are you not entertained? Ain't this what they tell you hustle for? I'm on my gladiator monologues, Russell Crowe. And honestly, I don't see what the fuss is for. You let your money blow and all we trying to do is sow it. Just so you know, this is kingdom biz. No Brooklyn Nets, I think we know who team this is. Come on, come on, and don't forget to bring the kids. And y'all gonna need a different planet just to dream this big. So bring your stacks to the table, and I'ma bring my then at the end of the day, we gon' see who win in this race This is God is the judge, you probably throw out my case So do us a favor, get that look off your face They be like you, spit that fire, get them industry rap Why you doing that Christian rap, nobody listen to that Then I reply with a sigh like I'm missing the fact I'm trying to spread this holy gospel till my savior get back I'm yeah. going in one time, these record labels all in my
my face Trying to forfeit my race But still I'm going in one time No matter the opposition I face Staying true to my face I'm about to give them what they want What they need, what they ask for Give them what they want, what they need what they want, what they need, what they ask for Give them what they want, what they need, what they ask for Well everything they off with, yeah I'ma give it back You can have it, crossing the world on my back Mr. Atlas, huh? I'm trying to get the people what they lacking That's why I act a donkey on the track Hit a passion, Ooh, got something to say You, you wanted to play, then come running my way And ruin G status is dead, no, ready to go About to go in, you already know Got my instructions, now give me your audience Hand me your mic and I'm ready to blow Rah. One for the money, two for the show Free for everybody who encouraged me to go, 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 get it We finally did it, I ain't never turning back Shawty, I'm fully committed, committed to my beliefs I'm committed to the city, committed to the streets I'm committed till they get it Now people calling my phone, check, telling me to not hold back Bring back that old set, bet it up, I'm on I'm that. going in one time, these record labels all in my face Trying to pull in my race, but still I'm going in one time No matter the opposition I face, staying true to my face I'm about to get you believe in the devil? I believe in the devil. I believe in the Holy Spirit. I'm a Christian. You ever play with the Ouija board? I never play with the Ouija board. Why not? I, this, this, this going too far. Whenever you want to have an in-depth, real conversation with a real distinguished gentleman, come to me. Not, not Big Steve. Mm. That's all I got to say. But come to Big Steve to get you a nice cut. And they lose your cup of hands. Give them what they want, what they need, what they ask for. Give them what they want, what they need, what they ask for.